Thanks, Amanda. And I I'll, will I'll, be quite quick on this, um, probably for various reasons. A lot of this is stuff that I've I've talked about before, um, probably at length and in, in a number of different situations. And those of you who are in the future of your profession session this morning may have heard some of this um, quite recently, so you can hum quietly to yourselves um, while, I'm, <laughs> while I'm talking, if you like. Um, I did come across, I had a look at definitions of capacity building as well, and I came across one that I, I quite liked, um, which, which I thought highlighted the, particularly the workforce and skills issues, um, an aspect of capacity building um, that I'm going to be talking about um, this afternoon. And a lot of the work that CIFA has done previously, IFA, um, over the last few years has been looking at the issue of capacity building in terms of skills through projects that were funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and by English Heritage um, in the past. And uh, other partners in the sector have worked on similar similar programmes, CBA's Community Archaeology um, Training Programme being, being one of those. And what, what I want to do, and what, what I'm really hoping that those that, that work, valuable as it was in itself, will do, is actually provide tools and, and building blocks that we can use now in to address a, a particular issue about about skills and access access to the skills that we need um, in the light of, of challenges such as those that, that Helen's um, just just described really. I'm going to refer a lot, an awful lot as well to the uh, Profiling the Profession report that Landward Research um, carried out on behalf of, of English Heritage um, for 2012-13. I was hoping that we would, we've got um, some funding from English Heritage Historic England to continue state of the market surveys over the next five years. I was hoping that the, the most recent report would be, be ready for this session, but unfortunately it wasn't as Kenny's, Kenny's in America um, and hasn't, hasn't quite finished it yet. Um, so I refer a lot to profiling the profession and start um, in the summary um, of the 2012-13 report. Um, it, the, the, it reported that uh, despite experiencing a reduction in the size of the workforce, slightly more employers anticipated that their, their companies would employ more staff in, in, <coughs> in, in a year's time. And I think the, the uh, census date for this was was I think August 2012. I'm looking at Doug, um, as if he should know the answer to that. Census date uh, would have been November. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and there were slightly more optimistic forecasts for three years hence. And and the, the summary notes that these these expectations were noticeably more cautious than they had been in 2007-8, um, which might indicate that as a profession we're kind of Rubbish at reading what reading um, what our capacity issues might be in the future. Um, obviously, in 2008, um, capacity reduced very very swiftly um, in the face of recession. But that's that's not intended as a criticism because it's actually very difficult, I think, to predict in in an industry that is very much at the whim of, of cycles and and factors outside of our control. It's very difficult um, to to plan ahead. I think. And I think that's one of the things that, that would be useful to consider is, is how far ahead should we be thinking. The session this morning um, anticipated a future in 2050 um, and there are all sorts of, of, of theories and, and variables being thrown out there that most of us who struggle to think two or even five years ahead um, might have found quite, quite terrifying, I think. Um, but the fact, the fact that it's difficult doesn't mean that we shouldn't be trying to do it, I think. And I think we do probably need to get a little bit better at predicting um, and understanding a little bit where our where our um, where our industry is going, so that we're in a position where we're actually driving the way that it wants to develop, where we want it to develop, rather than um, rather than reacting to external drivers um, that, are, that are that are outside our control. And I think some, some of the capacity issues that we face in terms of workforce and in terms of skills at the moment are completely predictable. Um, we've talked for a number of years about the, the aging demographic of, of some specialist areas, and that's, that's not a surprise. Those people didn't suddenly get 15 years older in, 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 a, year's, in a year's time. Um, we know that that's, that that's happening and that there are people who are working um, 
approaching retirement age or, or even working beyond um, retirement age. And I don't think it's any surprise to anybody that the reduction in numbers um, working in, in the industry um, as a result of the recession was going to cause a problem um, given an upturn in, in development. Um, that's, and, and neither is it unexpected the, um, the, the development surge that we're, that we're predicting at the moment um, has been a key feature of, of government's um, economic recovery strategy and has been well well publicised. So none, none of this is particularly surprising, um, I don't think. But again, planning for those for those issues, whilst we might be aware of them, is, is difficult. Um, and particularly when organisations are focusing through the recession on their continued, continued um, existence. Um, so there are a number of, there are a number of challenges that we face. Um, the insecure nature of our profession being one of them. Um, and I think English Heritage is historic England has, has done a, a lot of work so far in understanding um, a bit more about capacity building, what, what issues um, are coming up. <coughs> and understanding, having a better understanding of where, where we think the profession is heading, where we'd like it to head and how we, how we intend to get there. Um, the fluctuations in demand for archaeological services and, and, and therefore skills is something that is completely outside of our, our control in, in, in many ways. Um, but we do, and, and then this was highlighted by previous speakers, we do tend to react um, to short-term skills shortages um, without, without um, seemingly having, having a plan and having anticipated um, those issues. And there's plenty of skills data available through surveys like Profiling the Profession, um, the State of the Market survey. Um, and it would be interesting to have a look at those. I think what we've tended to use them for is, is illustrating what the situation is like now. We haven't tended to use those surveys so much for actually predicting trends in the future, although we do have that longitudinal data now that might, and it might be interesting to have a look at that to see how far those surveys allow us um, to make predictions and identify trends in the future and if they don't to, to think about whether we're actually asking the right questions and whether whether there are other questions that we should be that we should be asking and I think we've tended to rely on on fairly passive approaches and reactive approaches to recruitment um, very much reliant on the higher education sector to provide the uh, to provide the numbers of, of, of archaeologists and the, and the relevant skills. And I think sometimes we're looking at, at um, job adverts and, uh, that we see coming through, through um, the various sources, they very much repeat the same old, the same old requirements. And I, I wonder sometimes whether a more thoughtful approach to recruitment might actually bring in um, access to different, different skill sets and, and a, different, um, a different market, if you like, of future archaeologists. Um, we also have a sector that has the potential, and, and again the figures from profiling the profession show this, to contract or, or expand by about 30% over a very short space of time. And that's a huge challenge to deal with uh, when we're looking at, at, at numbers that might change like that. Um, and we also have added challenges that are, are non-archaeological, the sort of skills areas that, that we have to deal with in trying to, to um, build up some fam familiarity and expertise in. Um, allied to the construction sector, things like health and safety, CDM regulations, all those sorts of things, all the discussions that are going on about BIM at the moment, um, again, present very, very particular challenges. Um, so some, some of these challenges are very, they're very immediate, they're local challenges. How are we going to recruit enough skilled field archaeologists to meet the demand right now, um, never mind looking into the future? And if we can't access those skilled staff already, where are the, where are the recruits going to come from? Um, particularly if the uh, much anticipated drop in student numbers happens um, and we can't rely on higher education anymore um, to, to deliver the, the, the skills that, that we want. Um, Helen identified some of the skills gaps and shortages that, that, uh, that HS2 has identified in its, its work. Again, referring back to profiling the profession, um, the, the report identified a serious <coughs> skills shortage um, for post fieldwork analysis, and that's defined as, as more than 50% of respondents to the survey identifying that as a problem. Um, and it also defines significant uh, shortages in areas such as 
um, intrusive and non-intrusive fieldwork, artifact and ecofact conservation, and in information technology, as well as um, people management and project management skills in the in non-archaeologically specific um, skills areas, and, and perhaps perhaps inevitably. Um, the data from profiling the profession also showed, as a result of the recession, a reduction in the numbers of, of employers who responded positively to the questions about access to training plans, um, how they identified training needs, and, and the extent to which they evaluated the impact of training in their organisations. And, and we all know that, that when times are hard, training budgets, um, such, such as they exist at all, uh, are the first to be cut. So there are there are clearly some challenges about thinking imaginatively about cost-effective ways of delivering, delivering and, and developing skills. Some, some of the challenges we, we face are, are national challenges as well. They're, they're common across, across the, the sector and across the UK. And, and they'll only be addressed over a longer period of time. And I think there's an opportunity now um, to use the upturn in demand for services through um, projects like HS2 and and other other um, developments to to look at whether we can actually change the way we structure um, career entry and career development. Um, so can we use that to diversify the way that we recruit new talent, which I think is a key a key issue for us, and develop the sort of structured early career training that is is pretty commonplace and, and taken for granted in in other industries. And can we start to influence um, procurement processes so that things like, as Helen mentioned, commitments to skills development and quality are routinely considered alongside, alongside cost in determining choices, uh, the choice of contractor. And I think that demand side will, will stimulate supply, I think, um, once, once those questions are being asked at PQQ stage, um, then I think the sector, the sector will, will respond to that. In terms of, of solutions, I think I mean, these, are, these are issues that, that the sector needs to address and there isn't any one organisation who can really take that forward on its own. And I, I mean, it's inevitable in a session about capacity building that a lot of the, the, uh, the discussion will be about partnerships and, and partnership delivery. But I think some of the things that certainly from, from our point of view at CIFA and working with colleagues in FAME and in the national agencies and, and Historic England and Historic Scotland have been particularly um, proactive in, in terms of skills initiatives, um, is looking at support for business planning, for skills audits, um, organisational training plans within, within um, archaeological organisations as a matter of course, um, better defined career pathways that are linked to professional accreditation and again this morning we were discussing potential for development of chartered archaeology state status and that's something that we very much see as part of a, a progression starting at at career entry stage um, and and part of a, a defined um, pathway linked to to membership grades within within CIFA. Development of specialist skills is, is, a, is a tricky issue because so many specialists have been outsourced and, and, and work as freelance um, and, and actually accessing in terms of succession planning and making sure that those skills are retained um, in, in the industry when individuals retire is, is, is very difficult, it's a challenge um, to, to address. We've, we've looked at that in some of the um, workplace learning placements um, that we worked with where we worked in partnership with organisations who brought in um, individual specialists to help provide provide training to to early career specialists, and I think that's something that's a model that could be that could be rolled out more widely. Um, better links and dialogue between course providers and and the end users of training, both the employees who are being trained and the employers who are access, accessing that training, as to whether it actually is really fulfilling their needs and it is a cost effective. Uh, way of approaching approaching the problem, um, more support for investment in skills, and I think looking at multi-talented practitioners, um, diversifying and being more flexible about the sorts of skills that we have, and accepting that we will need all of us need a diversity of skills in our in our armory in the future um, to cover the many different areas that we might be asked to to address, um, and more serious consideration of succession planning 
how in consideration of how we develop and how we promote new talent and existing talent and nurturing leadership skills within organizations which is an, an area that, that that seems to have been um, neglected in, in, in some ways. And then again potential for developing new ways in to the profession and particularly um, apprenticeships as a, as a potential in the future which is, which is a, an exciting development that, uh, that we hope very much hope to see coming, coming on stream in the next few years and, and hopefully in time to take advantage of um, increased demand for, for archaeologists. In, 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 the next, in the next few years. And I think the opportunities are here now to develop all of these ideas further, um, supported by that demand. The, the building blocks already exist, we're not reinventing, we're not reinventing wheels here. Um, and I think it's important because of the, the insecurity of the profession, because of the resource issues that we face, um, to use the information and the tools and the resources and the support that's available, rather than inventing new structures. Capacity building um, was a key aim of the um, HLF supported training bursary scheme and the Skills for the Future program and of the various um, Historic England workplace learning um, placements and through those schemes it's enabled us to develop um, a suite of tools and resources that will allow organisations within the heritage sector to provide for their own training needs in the future. And these include training plans, um, linked to national occupational standards, template learning agreements, monitoring documents, guidance on how to use them, guidance on how to set up training, training placements. And the experience from, from the CIFA and the CBA schemes are distilled into these two publications which I'm clutching here, uh, a CIFA professional practice paper on um, providing early career training in your organisation and a CBA research bulletin. Um, they're both available from the websites of, of those two organisations. There are copies of this one on the CIFA stand downstairs. I don't know if the CBA um, bulletin is available there, there too, but they're, they're, if you haven't seen them already, I'd certainly encourage you um, to, to pick them up. The CBA version has, has all the example documents in, in the back of it, and um, they're, they're, they're very useful in terms of, of structuring, um, structuring training vision. And I, I'm aware that, that many employers are start, uh, have started and, and do have these, these schemes in place and they're often innovative solutions um, to the challenges um, and the skills issues that they face. And the best of these are structured um, with learning <coughs> outcomes defined at the outset, as I said, linked to national occupational standards, clearly defined routes to progression, including membership of, of the appropriate professional body, support mechanisms in place and an emphasis on, on CPD and that's exactly the sort of response that the HLF funded programme was, was designed to, uh, to stimulate and that's something that, that certainly from CIFA's point of view will carry on encouraging and supporting um, wherever we can. So I think just, just a very quick summary really, um, we can't control the demand for archaeological services, that's, that's um, that's outside of our control so we need to be able to forecast it better and also to be able to react quickly um, in, in to that information and that means having the structures in place so that we can respond um, and when we talk about the sector in that in that sense it's not just about see for having those structures in place or even individual organizations but down to the level of the individual themselves with their CPD log and their personal development plan and an idea of the skills that they think that they want to develop and, and will need in the future. These tools already exist. Um, putting it all together and particularly using the National Occupational Standards mm -hmm. to underpin it, I think takes us much more, much closer to a structured strategic approach that, that we need. Um, and I'll just finish because I'm, I'm aware that, um, that this has been a rather boring set of slides for you to look at. Um, while I was researching this, um, I came across uh, the Guardian Pass notes on capacity building and how they define it. So if you do want to find out what Cheryl Cole's hair and capacity building have in common, I'd suggest that you Google the Guardian from the 26th of August in 2013 um, and find out. Thank you. Thank you.